Hi everyone, uh, welcome to today's uh, Collegium Talks. Uh, it's the third one and today we're going to be talking about how can history inform current gender politics and policy. So we'll start with uh, a short talk by myself, I'm Louise Settle, and then we'll move on to a talk from my colleague Robert Mason and he'll introduce himself shortly. So, um, Right, so today uh, I'll talk uh, just a bit about my research on the history of crime, gender and sexuality. And in particular, um, my recent book, well, it will be out in January, coming January 2022, about the history of probation in Britain uh, from 1907 to 1962. So the book uh, looks at various different types of offences uh, that occurred in the home or involved intimate partner relationships. Uh, but what I want to talk today about in particular is domestic violence because I think that's been something, uh, it's a big issue at the moment, especially thanks to COVID and people being um, isolated and um, required to stay in the domestic space. Uh, and the reason, well, I wanted to talk about uh, some of the things uh, whilst re researching my book that I thought were still relevant today. And in fact, uh, my last chapter, the conclusion, does try to do this a little bit, but I actually um, was thinking of having a longer chapter and I kind of felt hesitant and I wasn't sure about the role that historians should play. Uh, and was it, was it my place as a historian to make any comments on current policy as I am not an expert on current policy, but I still think that we have some um, something that we can bring to the table in terms of our knowledge about uh, domestic violence, but other topics uh, more generally. So. Um, just to back up a little bit, some of the findings from my research um, showed uh, about pr probation policy and how it could be useful or how it was useful in certain situations involving domestic violence. Uh, in the first half or the first 60 years of the 20th century in Britain, so in particular, it was better than one of the more common sentences, which was fines or uh, prison sentences. So. The, sh the sentences themselves were so short that there was no chance for uh, rehabilitation. So it didn't sort of um, deal with any of the underlying problems behind why abuse was happening. And instead, they were just released from prison to go back home and uh, potentially commit more violence. So probation aimed to um, deal with some of the uh, underlying problems. And one of those um, was alcohol abuse. So the probation service was closely connected with the abstinence movement. And um, once a man was put on probation, he could be required to refrain from drinking alcohol, for example. And there were other conditions that he must follow, for example, remaining in employment, not associating with certain criminals, and uh, various other sort of like also social support uh, for the family and helping uh, the husband find employment. So uh, there was certainly uh, evidence I found for probation being a really useful uh, method. And um, many of the lessons that, have, uh, that I saw could be useful for today. Uh, however, um, my research also showed how uh, sort of the, the drawbacks and the problems associated with using probation sentences. So there was this, uh, a concern that it could just be used as a let off. So rather than sending men to prison, they were released and there was little supervision. So it was crucial what type of supervision happened. And that was kind of a, a postcode lottery, depending on um, the, the expertise and the sort of uh, the personnel in different probation um, services across the country. Uh, and then it also showed how it depended very much on individual circumstances and the, the situation and the, the the individual perpetrator, and very much uh, there were situations where prison or other protective measures were required and were lacking. So, um, oh, and, and overall, uh, just to highlight that uh, the um, the quality of the rehabilitation programs were essential in determining whether or not probation was successful at actually successfully rehabilitating men and stopping uh, further violence from occurring. Oh, wrong way. Okay, so that's why um, it was really frustrating for myself and other experts in probation and, and, and probation practitioners when in 2014 the UK uh, Conservative government decided to part privatise the probation service. So all of the experts, 
well, almost all of them, uh, realized that this would be a horrendous policy. Um, and in, in the context of pr uh, domestic violence, it was especially problematic because it put uh, women and children at risk. So what happened was that these um, medium to low risk offenders were um, the supervision of these offenders were, was given over to these um, community rehabilitation companies, which were a mixture of private and sort of charity organizations. And uh, they failed. And uh, in 2018, there was a very damning report made that showed how um, dangerous this policy of trying to save money by outsourcing probation uh, was so basically the the profit was prioritized over the safety of the women and children so contractual targets were pri uh, prioritized over good quality and safe practices and practitioners were given unmanageable workloads and needed and they needed much more training and support and this was partly due to um, they, they sacked a lot of staff and uh, you no longer needed the same level of qualifications to be a probation officer so the training and expertise a lot of that was lost and not replaced all in the, the name of saving money. Uh, and this all meant that the work to protect victims was also of grave concern because these programs, again, were cut back in the interest of saving money and making a profit. So it was very frustrating for experts when uh, political um, sort of factors and the political policies that have nothing to do with expert advice are just ignored for... Um, you know, furthering ambitions around uh, cutting spending and, um, you know, neoliberal, neoliberal policies in general. So it kind of led me to think, like, what can we do about this? Um, however, uh, the experts weren't completely ignored, and it was realized that this policy was failing. And then in December 2020, um, all of the, uh, the, well, they basically got rid of the involvement of these um, CRC companies, and it, the service was put back into, was renationalized basically. So it kind of shows uh, eventually the experts were listened to, but in the meantime, uh, many women and children were put at risk, and uh, it was a, uh, financially, it was a complete disaster. So privatized didn't say, privatizing didn't save any money, and in fact, um, cost a lot of money as the government had to bail out many of these companies that went bankrupt. Uh, and again, just going back to some more um, sort of lessons from my historical research, I think as I mentioned, um, my research showed that uh, poverty and lack of wel welfare support was a key factor behind why many women didn't feel able to report abuse or continue to live with abusive partners. And uh, many experts have shown this, uh, yet uh, it's still being ignored. So the austerity policy since 2009 has meant the defunding of uh, refuges for women and less economic support more generally for uh, low-income families. So it's, again, very frustrating that all of um, sort of the expertise on um, domestic violence and probation are, again, being ignored and in, in the interest of saving money. And then just to end by talking about saving money. Uh, so throughout the history of probation, uh, the probation service themselves and, and those who support it have been champion, like championing uh, the fact that it does save money. So it is actually a cost-effective um, criminal justice um, method. Um, and I read recently in the news this article from Ule in October about how um, Finland is thinking about uh, increasing the amount of people placed on probation rather than sent to closed f prison facilities. And I'm certainly not an expert on policy in Finland, but from what I've gathered, you actually have quite a good um, system here. So uh, it's kind of a word of warning, uh, and I hope it doesn't... Um, basically don't follow what happened in the UK, uh, because the reason I, I mentioned this article is that, that the, the cost-saving benefits of probation are kind of headlined here. And although it is, it does save a lot of money, for example, um, close, uh, close prison facilities, uh, one, one day per person is 225 euros, whereas supervised pro probation is 63 euros. So that, that is good. And it does save a lot of money in the long run because they, um, it's been shown uh, that the sort of long term, the, the savings from being able to stop people repeating, uh, having repeat offenses, saves a lot of money in the long run. But prioritizing this sort of narrative about money saving is very dangerous if you then 
continue that the way that uh, the, uh, England and Wales did uh, to then keep trying to save money by privatizing and cost-saving methods. So as, I guess that's just a little bit of a warning uh, from the UK uh, to Finland. So I'll, I'll stop there, uh, and we've got more to say in the questions time, and I'll move on to uh, Robert Mason, and he can introduce himself now. Thank you. And thank you, uh, uh, Louise. Uh, we're now going to, um, uh, we'll continue our conversation um, about uh, public policy a little bit uh, later, but in, in, in my section, just, just hear my introductory remarks, I'm going to turn our attention a little bit from public policy and towards electoral politics, as well as moving across the Atlantic um, from a focus on the United Kingdom and England and Wales in particular, um, across to the uh, United uh, States. Uh, we're both um, fellows at the moment at the Helsinkian, Helsinki Collegium um, uh, here at the University of, of Helsinki, um, doing research on different aspects of gender, but from public policy uh, towards electoral uh, politics. And it was, my starting point is this, it was just over a year ago now that Donald Trump, trying to achieve re-election as president of the United States, experienced instead defeat at the hands of Joe Biden. In that election, Biden won uh, about 51% of the popular vote. And Trump, meanwhile, um, he had the support of just under 47% of Americans overall. A clear defeat for Donald Trump, even if Trump tried to insist that somehow he was the rightful victor of that election. And yet, even in losing the election of 2020, Trump was rather more successful among some voters, while he was less successful among others. And, and one of the ways uh, we can see uh, Trump's relative success among some is by thinking about gender. Trump's margin of defeat was 51 to 47 percent, but according to polling amongst men, he was the preferred candidate by 50 to 48 percent. Meanwhile, women rather overwhelmingly rejected Trump, um, voting in support of Biden 55 to 44 percent, not a narrow margin at all. And when we think about race as well as gender, the differences become yet more significant. White men preferred Trump to Biden actually by a landslide, 57 to 40 percent. And even amongst white women, there was a majority in favor of Trump, in this case, 53 to 46 percent. So in 2020, in white America, there was a majority who voted for Trump, and among men in America, there was a majority who voted for Trump. Of course, in, in many ways, uh, Trump was an unusual politician, and in many ways, the political climate of 2020 was exceptional. But the fact that the voting behavior of men was different from the voting behavior of women, the fact that there was a gender gap was not so unusual, not so exceptional. And indeed, this, um, uh, this modern gender gap has existed in American electoral politics for more than 40 years now. Uh, and it's the history that is behind this chart that's the focus of, of my research at, at the moment um, that I'm, I'm pursuing here in, in Helsinki. Uh, this gender gap. It's an aspect of electoral politics that social scientists have explored, but it's also part of political history that historians have, on the whole, neglected. But if we're thinking about this history in the United, in the United States, then the starting point is probably this moment, uh, Election Day 1980. On that day, presumably Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan voted the same way. But when people analyzed the results of the election that took place on that day in November 1980, there was quite a lot of surprise. 
when people discovered that men and women had responded quite differently to the campaign, Reagan defeated Jimmy Carter, the incumbent president, quite narrowly among women, but quite overwhelmingly among, among men. So at that moment, there was some surprise about the arrival of this modern gender gap um, in voting. And there would have been yet more surprise if people had realized back in 1980 that this would still be um, a feature of American electoral politics well into the 21st century. And that's because in 1980, uh, people assumed that the gender gap was a transient phenomenon, a specific response to the issues of the moment. And in particular, it was considered to be a form of engagement with feminism. And that's because one of the biggest debates in American politics and society during the 1970s was all about the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, which aimed to make the American Constitution protective of gender equality. It was a big debate, of course, because it was about an important question. But also this amendment uh, became rather controversial. Um, this is an example of a demonstration in favor of the amendment, in favor of feminism. But there were also demonstrations and protests during the 1970s against the amendment uh, during the 1970s uh, in the United States, the debate about the Equal Rights Amendment um, inspired the development of anti-feminism. And this anti-feminism was a key part of an upsurge for conservatism that took place in America during this decade. The conservative enthusiasm against the Equal Rights Amendment during the 1970s led the Republican Party in 1980 to embrace this position to come out against the Equal Rights Amendment. And that was a significant development because all the way back to 1940, the Republican Party had supported the idea of an Equal Rights Amendment as part of the Constitution. In 1980, at last, after 40 years, there was a chance for this amendment to become part of the Constitution. But at this moment, the Republican Party instead became a force for anti-feminism, opposing protections for gender equality. And so many people in 1980 and 1981 um, um, saw that the alignment between Reagan and the Republican Party on the one hand and anti-feminism on the other, it provided a logical explanation for the gender gap. But pretty soon, uh, people uh, found out that what seemed to be logical did not, at least in this case, provide a convincing explanation for the gender gap. Even though there was a gender division in American politics, this division did not, in fact, uh, characterize opinion on gender issues. And polls usually showed that men were as likely as women to support the Equal Rights Amendment. And there were many women who were part of the anti-feminist movement. So feminism did not explain the gender gap. Even so, into the 1980s, gender issues remained central to understandings of the gender gap. Not surprisingly, really, when gender inequality remained so significant in American society and politics, not surprisingly, um, when this effort to include gender protections in the Constitution would soon fail. And meanwhile, after the election of 1980, feminists played an important role in asserting that this connection did exist between the Republican Party's failure to support their agenda and the emergence of the gender gap, the national organization for women in particular, some of them campaigning there in the mid-1970s, the key organization campaigning for gender equality. They promoted this idea, trying to make the political arena more responsive to their agenda. This activism 
by feminists was significant, but meanwhile, politicians were thinking about these issues and reaching different conclusions. At the White House of Ronald Reagan, the gender gap was identified as a problem, and there was analysis, there was debate about how to solve the problem. And it was Elizabeth Dole, who was the aide, who led an investigation of the gender gap, and, and the work that she led was thoughtful, insightful, and there are many parallels between the work that she did and the work that social scientists were doing at about the same time in trying to analyze what was taking place in electoral politics. But if Dole's analysis was thoughtful, from a Republican perspective, um, her conclusions were also quite discouraging because for Dole, ideas about the state, about the role of the state in American society were at the heart of the gender gap. Women were more likely than men to believe in the importance of what Americans call big government to provide a safety net, to provide assistance for those in need. So the implications of Dole's analysis was that the Republican Party could tackle the problem of declining support among women by being more supportive of the state as a positive force in society. But Dole also understood uh, that, um, especially during the 1980s, when Reagan, the president, was talking about an attack on big government, the kind of solution that seemed clear to her that would make a difference. Such a solution was out of the question. It was out of line with dominant ideas in the Republican Party. And at best, uh, she thought Republicans could simply do a better job at trying to uh, win over women who were more socioeconomically privileged, who were successful in Reagan's America, who were sympathetic or potentially sympathetic to this attack on big government. And, in the end, the Reagan administration didn't even really do that. And um, the Reagan response to the gender gap was really one of symbolism involving slightly greater visibility for women in the administration. Elizabeth Dole, an example, um, she became transportation secretary and part of Ronald Reagan's cabinet. Of course, um, you know, um, of course appointments such as that one um, uh, they were a positive development, but the administration remained overwhelmingly male-dominated and the agenda of the administration was not amended as a result of this discovery that overall it was in closer alignment with the concerns of more men than it was with the concerns of more women. And meanwhile, in the Democratic Party, there was parallel reflection on the way in which more support amongst women could become an enduring advantage, but there was also a parallel concern about the decline in support among men. How to achieve that? Not so clear for the Democrats, just as the problem facing the Republican Party seemed resistant to solution. And so even though both Democrats and Republicans try to solve the problem of the gender gap from the perspective of their own party, we see instead the consolidation of this gender gap over time. What was surprising in 1980 uh, became an, um, a normal expected element of the American electoral landscape. And if the years uh, since 1980 have often been a period of conservative, domi uh, of conservative dominance, of, of Republican success, at the polls, then this has usually been because of the votes of men, much more than the votes of women. Uh, this chart uh, shows the vote by gender for the Democratic presidential candidate with the um, votes of, of men on the left and the votes of women on, on the right. Only on a few occasions did the Democrat fail to gain the votes of most women. By contrast, most men have never been on the side of the Democrat, even in the election of 2008 when Obama became president. Still, the proportion of support among men remained less than 50%. Here, by contrast, uh, the chart that shows the other side of the coin, the, 
the vote for the Republican presidential candidate. Um, and this shows that it's been unusual for a Republican not to have the support of a majority among men. Well, as, as, as I mentioned, when, when Ronald Reagan became president in 1980 and people noticed a gender gap, that was with surprise. But in the context of history, um, those differences should have been somewhat less surprising because, in fact, 1980 was not the first occasion on which men and women had voted differently, though for earlier periods there are problems of, of data, less is known about earlier periods. But this earlier gender gap uh, tended to involve a slightly greater likelihood that women were supportive of the Republican Party than men, quite different from the situation in 1980 and Beyond uh, uh, this chart uh, shows the percentage of voters who saw themselves as aligned with the Republican Party. The top line on the left side of the chart um, refers to women. Back in the 1950s, more women than men were habitual supporters of the Republican Party. Gradually, over time, that line falls away and the other line becomes higher. Um, Something happened over time, men more likely than women to be supporters of the Republican Party. And during the 1960s and 1970s, there were, there were new conservatives who started to uncover in ways unnoticed at the time, but they started to uncover more support among men than women. These were politicians who in different ways were fusing populism and conservatism in new ways. Barry Goldwater, the Republican uh, candidate for president in 1964, then George Wallace, a third party candidate for president in 1968. Spiro Agnew, uh, who was vice president between 1969 and 1973, all of them in ways not much noticed at the time were starting to activate a gender gap by gaining more support amongst men. It's history that suggests the way in which uh, people in the 1980s discussed the gender gap was in some ways flawed, flaws that have probably continued to characterize debates about the gender gap today. Back in the 1980s, um, the assumption behind, behind the debate about the gender gap was that the norm was defined by the voting behavior of men. The voting behavior of women was the element that was unusual compared to what was normal. And yet, what we see in 1980 was change not amongst women, but among men. The reason for Ron Reagan's victory in 1980 and the revitalization of the Republican Party that took place during the 80s and beyond was movement among men from the Democrats and towards the Republicans, even, even before then the proportion of women preferring the Republican Party had slipped. And this movement of, of men to the Republican Party took place at a time when Reagan was following in the footsteps, at least of Barry Goldwater, in articulating a new form of conservatism. Even so, ever since that time, um, the debate about the gender gap has usually focused on women as voting differently from men, rather than involving reflections on how men do not share an outlook on politics similar to that of women. In itself, that kind of perspective on this phenomenon of the gender gap reveals the dominance of gendered assumptions within how the political world has been understood, but it's also suggestive of an incomplete understanding of the history of gender and voting in the United States. So with that, um, I think um, we're going to uh, move back uh, from thinking about electoral politics to um, thinking about the realm of uh, public uh, policy. Of course, the two things are significantly uh, connected. So. Um, uh, uh, Luis, if I if I may um, ask maybe um, a question or two about about your um, about, about what you, about your presentation and um, 
one of the things you were talking about was the way in, in which you have been thinking and analyzing uh, public uh, policy in the context of the history that you have been, if, if you, the history that you've been, you've been studying. And if, if you were making decisions about the right direction for public policy, what kind of direction on the basis of the history you have studied would you be uh, suggesting? Thanks. I'm just going to grab some water and answer that. <laughs> oh, if I can manage to drink it with a microphone. Oh. Thanks, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a little dangerous to try and make suggestions when you're not actually a policy expert, but uh, I guess some of the things I've been thinking about, well, uh, probably to give some more context, it's important that the, the, there's a new domestic abuse act uh, passed this year, actually, 2001, and that has actually sort of um, improved. <laughs> the, the, the new legislation is quite good in um, promoting um, more awareness and new policies uh, aimed at uh, helping victims and survivors of domestic violence. But uh, in, in that context, uh, I think there's some, it could still make some criticisms based on uh, historical knowledge about domestic violence and probation. So some of the points, um, so one of the, the good things about the new act is that it's um, put, um, it's, it's mandatory for local governments to provide um, safe accommodation for um, people escaping from domestic violence. And so that, that's, a, that's a really good start. As I mentioned, like one of the big problems uh, for women to leave abusive um domestic environments is, uh, you know, becoming homeless and like the article that I showed is, um, is still a big problem now. So that's trying to tackle some of that, uh, that was, uh, so that, that's good, but it's not, I don't think that they actually give any more funding. So what they're doing is making the, the local governments um, ensure that they have this housing, but they're not creating more housing and they're still relying on charities to provide that. And that's problematic. So in, in my research, I've looked at the, the role of the voluntary sector and it is actually uh, uh, amazing. They do really great work and they are some of the most the experts in providing these services. However, the funding aspect, again, going back to the money, um, is crucial. So it's very much again, a postcode lottery. So whether or not they have good uh, funding depends on the charitable donations that they receive, or they do, they can bid for government funding, but it's all very um, unsecure and not very stable. So there's in many of the shelters, there's this, um, you know, they don't know from year to year how much, um, how many services they can provide. So uh, yeah, again, it's just about uh, my, <laughs> My my uh, thoughts would be it's it's not just a good to talk about words or or have these recommendations. It needs to be backed up with actual funding, and um, that, I'm not the only one to think that. But uh, it's just throughout the history when I've been reading, it's always been about saving money, and you can, then you always see the the problems that happen when you don't fund the services properly. Whether that's the probation service, in um, so another recommendation would be the, the programs themselves. So they've had in the past some, some good attempts at um, providing, for, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy um, or uh, other types of um, sort of uh, intervention programs, rehabilitation programs, um, many of them based on sort of feminist ideas um, and they, they varying success levels, but so, some of the ones that have been successful then have ended due to funding cuts. So again, it it comes down to actually taking the matter seriously and and, and putting the money behind that. Um, so that was one thing. Oh, and then another aspect is that uh, the good thing about the new act is that it's um, sort of giving statutory authority to Claire's law. So this idea that uh, people who are, sus uh, are starting a new relationship can ask for um, ask the police for the records about the person, this particular individual, and if certain um, qualifications are met, then they are given information about whether they have a criminal record in terms of domestic violence. So now that's not just a recommendation that's going to be put into law. However, again, it's kind of falls short of what the survivors and victims of domestic violence uh, wanted themselves. So they were petitioning for uh, actually to have like a... Um, 
uh, a, ch a register for uh, perpetrators of domestic violence and um, so that they could be integrated into the one that's already existing for s sexual offenders. Uh, and this is much more sort of serious. Um, it's, it's more than, it, it's like a, there's more uh, powers, I suppose, around uh, what happens if you're put on a register. So again, it's, um, th there's some moves in the right direction, but it's not necessarily taking it seriously enough. And again, not, not listening to the to the people who have experienced violence and the survivors and the victims. So again, that would be another recommendation is to follow uh, their experiences. And in my research, I try to look at uh, experiences of, of the people of involved. And so I guess that that is really crucial that we listen to uh, their experiences and, and what they were wanting was this register. Uh, and that's fallen short, unfortunately. So oh, if so, when we look at, at history and the kind of research that you have have been doing, there's a there's a lot of evidence which is m which maybe policymakers can can lose sight of. But this longer term perspective and this evidence, it can inform it can in, inform policy development very effectively. But you raise a, a question in in a bigger question in in um, what you are. Uh, in, in your presentation about how historians can make that happen or what is really the role of, of historians. So, so how about, how about your, your own experience? Have you, have you had experience of, of trying to achieve these connections between, between hi historical research and, and the policy, policy arena and w what's happened when you've uh, explored those connections? Yeah, I have, uh, to a limited extent. So I was part of a bigger project with the University of Edinburgh, Cambridge and Sheffield, and we were uh, funded by the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK to, um, to do a project about the history of uh, child sexual abuse. So there was uh, various different parts of this project looking at the role of the media, the role of the criminal justice system, and the role of um, various statutory bodies and um, third sector like charities and things. Uh, so I was looking at the role of the media. Um, however, uh, so, so we we published our findings in um, various different, um, more public formats rather than the, the standard sort of academic peer review journals in attempt to make the, the the knowledge and the information more publicly accessible. And I think that was successful. And uh, for example, we. Uh, the History and Policy website does a very good job of kind of connecting historians with policymakers. So we, we were publishing there and different kinds of ways to like make it like easier to access or, or, or like a quicker and more punchy for people in policy who haven't got time to read these kind of long, <laughs> long uh, academic journal articles. So I hope that that maybe they, they were more successful. And we also published in like you know just regular newspapers. Um, but uh, it's hard to gauge you know how much influence that has. So another part of the project was to, we were invited to like give sort of recommendations or uh, um, I forget the exact term, but w there was the inquiry into sexual abuse, the official uh, government inquiry uh, from 2015. And that's had a lot of problems along the way, but we were involved quite early on, but uh, it wasn't an official capacity. We were just there to kind of help give some context and advice. So unlike in other countries where it's actually been historians that have been the ones conducting the inquiry, or at least uh, having more of a, an official role, um, even if they weren't the actual, always the, um, the chairman or anything like that, but they were having much more influence. Like in Finland, for example, um, there was uh, the historians um, based in Uvascular uh, were very much involved in sort of uh, the historical research and finding the historical cases t um, for the for the Finnish inquiry. And I forget details now, but other countries, I think Australia and possibly a few of the other Nordic countries have been historians have played a key role in this. So when I compare like our role to other countries, the role of historians in other countries, mm -hmm. I feel like uh, we didn't maybe make as much of a, as a difference as I would have liked. Um, and uh, I think there could be a, a, bit, a bigger role, at least in the UK, in following examples from outside. Um, but how we actually do that uh, is what I'm still uh, struggling with. And um, uh, do you have any thoughts about um, how historians might be, or might be able to um, 
to make more of a difference and uh, what, what we would need to sort of have in place to, to make us feel able to do that or want to do that. And, but also uh, another point to this would be like, do you actually think it's worthwhile and important and our role? Like you could say it's not our role. So I just, th yeah. did you have some thoughts about that? <laughs> yeah, so I think that the work that, that I do on, um, on electoral politics, and there's obviously, um, there's obviously a, a connection with the uh, realm of, of public, uh, public policy, but uh, the work that, that I do on electoral politics uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe provides uh, fewer opportunities for lesson learning as such. I mean, I think it's quite often the case that the people who are involved in, in politics are kind of um, interested in history from, from that point of view. And when I've been doing research on American political history, uh, time and again, I've seen how American politicians were very interested in, always in the example of Harry Truman, who was candidate for president in 1948, because he made an amazing electoral comeback and he won when everybody was expecting him to get defeated but 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 maybe um but maybe electoral politics you know is l less useful from that point of view in generating lessons but but maybe as well um thinking about the history gives you a, a deeper un understanding um of of some of these trends o over time and in in the case of the gender gap it's you know it's, it's it seems no notable to me that time and again there's a sort of a similar debate taking place without really thinking about the longer history and there have been i think over this 40 years only a r relatively small number of occasions when people have started to think differently and helpfully about that in 1994 um you know, people started to talk about angry white men as an important force in American politics. And maybe the whole of the debate could have usefully thought about the phenomenon of angry white men. But, but it, it does, it does, it, it's not straightforward to, I guess, to achieve interactions between, between historians and, and, and the policy arena. I think interesting to reflect on those comparisons with how it works well it, in Finland, say, and, and for um, you know, people in other countries to uh, reflect on, on the good examples in that way as well. I suppose as, as historians too, and, and the kind of endeavor that um, you know, our colleagues collectively are engaged with um, at the university um, and at the collegium, you know, it's great when those interactions happen, but it's also okay when, you know, history doesn't directly inform the, the present day, even if that's something that informs the work that both of us do too. Yeah, absolutely. It's not, um, I mean, you could even argue it's not the role of historians to get too involved in, in politics, uh, and that makes, mm -hmm. you know, we, we need to mm -hmm. be a bit more objective. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I, I guess I, I don't feel like that because I, yeah. I want to, to, I guess, make yeah. some kind of difference. Yeah. And when you, I think it's just so frustrating when you're reading things happening again and again and nobody's doing anything about it. So it, it certainly makes me want to do something, but that's probably more of a personal political project of mine. But um, I guess uh, I, I'm wondering also like the role of history, maybe not in necessarily like specific contexts about domestic violence or, or uh, other the gender voting mm -hmm. gap, mm -hmm. but more like uh, how important like historical knowledge or, or historical ways of thinking or s skills, how that's important um, in, in, in society in mm -hmm. terms of like mm -hmm. making or creating people with critical thinking skills um, with some historical knowledge so that they, um, or, or have some kind of ability to understand um, or find facts mm -hmm. and, and distinguish between mm -hmm. um, different sources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do you, th do you have any opinions about mm -hmm. um, sort of the, yeah the role that history should play in terms of education or um, our role in informing mm -hmm. the discussion mm -hmm. about these kind of issues? Yeah, I, s I suppose that as 
I mean, I, I suppose as historians, we, we always find history in interesting, and we also <laughs> think that doing history is a, is a, good, is a good idea, <laughs> yeah, in, in, you know, exactly as you say, to, uh, fo you know, to foster those, those skills of critical scrutiny and doing research and also, you know, looking at the evidence and, and seeing what, what you find without expecting to find, to, you know, to find evidence to support one conclusion or, um, or, or another conclusion and then um you know um i guess then there are always you know debates about what takes place in in schools and you know many of these conservatives who i have studied in different ways over over time have had a very strong view about promoting a study of of history in schools in a way that has a that 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 offers a certain kind of interpretation uh, and I suppose that, you know, somehow um, we'd like to, to think about the ways in which uh, school, school history can, you know, foster that kind of reflection on, on society and, and change o over time while opening things up for, for, for people studying history at all levels to reach their own conclusions one way or, yeah. or another. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, actually, when reflecting on your talk, when you were saying about how women were voting mm. more, um, the, the long term mm. it's about having a bigger government mm -hmm. and more uh, support, mm -hmm. sort of welfare s um, support and yeah, policies that help have a safety net, etc. So that, that really talks to, mm -hmm. to, to, my, to my research. And then also, again, in terms of like the bigger picture about history, um, what you're saying in terms of like what kind of history you teach. So if you're teaching this kind of like... Um, I don't know, the <laughs> political history about great thinkers and kind of, I guess, the history that maybe some people f expect or find a bit, well, I find boring. <laughs> but uh, it's kind of like dates and numbers. And uh, instead of like looking at um, the history of the welfare state, for example, or the social history approaches that then, you know, kind of make you appreciate and understand the, the need for... Um, for a bigger for a bigger state. So I suppose if you had these instead of focusing on wars and politics all the time, if you focused on some of the, the sort of social issues that the, the reason why we need a welfare state, for example, um, I don't know if that would help uh, change <laughs> some men's opinions about the role of the state if they had a different kind of education in the first place uh, about how bad it can be when the state isn't uh, providing these kind of services. Yeah. Or is that a bit? Yeah, y yeah, and I, uh, ab uh, yeah, ab absolutely. And I, I, I should, I should say, um, I mean, you know, thinking about what, what, what I was saying in, in my more introductory uh, comments, that of course, you know, it's uh, then, the, uh, uh, you know, gender. It's, n it's not a, a voting block in, in the way that I know. Maybe environmentalists could be a voting block. So, mm, so okay, you, yeah. you know, definitely in the seventies within anti-feminism, there were powerful female voices and equally, um, the, the, you know, uh, during this period, there were, you know, there were, there were men who, who, who also shared those ideas of big of government having an important role yeah. too. And, you know, it's, a re I think, a reminder t t to me, well, we, we try to analyze things and to use, um, you know, to use constructs in order to help us to analyze something. but. Often history is about discovering the exceptions as yeah. as well, and about um, you know the yeah about about the way in which what what looks clear cut at f first sight becomes a bit blurred when um, yeah when you look into more detail. And maybe one of the challenges in interacting with the policy arena is that people who are engaging policymakers you know want something which is a little bit more clear cut by way of um, an example. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think there's also from my research, it's mm -hmm. fine. Like the conclusions keep being, uh, it's complicated or it's, um, mm -hmm. it really depends on the the situation, which mm -hmm. I th maybe I hopefully got through mm -hmm. earlier. Like it's it's very you can't it's very hard to make mm -hmm. one policy for everyone, especially with uh, domestic violence. When, um, for example, the different programs uh, that you could have um, might mm -hmm. work for some men and not for other men, and um, so. Um, Mm -hmm. From the historical research, you can see mm -hmm. see that happening, but that's not convenient mm -hmm. uh, when you're trying to make policy uh, t for for us to say, well, actually, it's, you've got to have like ten different uh, programs because mm -hmm. that's expensive and complicated mm -hmm. to to do. But um, 
at least I think when you the tendency to kind of ignore stuff that happened because a long time ago or like the early 20th century as if that's completely irrelevant but actually I keep seeing the same debates for example about the role of charities or um, and like third sector public sector and their relationships like those debates have been going on for a really long time and then we kind of have like it's almost like oh it's a new debate like the role of charities and the problems associated with that so um, yeah I think it's just um, important for historians to have that input to, to remind people not to invent, mm -hmm. reinvent the wheel again mm -hmm. and things that maybe did work or didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so we already know that certain, certain policies didn't work in the past, let's not do them again, or like there were really good policies mm -hmm. actually, and then they just get stopped because of new political regimes or, or funding cuts. So it's, I think it's helpful to mine that information so you can um, not keep re repeating the same. That's a bit of a cliche, but yeah, <laughs> repeating the same mistakes or, or, or not even mistakes, but like ignoring um, the things that didn't happen, I suppose. Like the, there was a lot of like policy um, r reports and that, that, that then never became policy, but then the, the, the research behind them is still useful. Yeah. Uh, and so if we are, if we sort of look around, because uh, you, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the work of historians from Uvascular in, in Finland and also about your, your own, own experience in, in part as part of the bigger history and policy project, which has been going on for a while in, in the United Kingdom. I mean, do you have any thoughts if, if you kind of look around the world about any historians who who for you stand out as somebody who, or, or people who are doing interesting historical research who are then able to connect with uh, a policy debate and are able to, uh, to influence the way uh, you know, people understand the world. As you were saying, it's not an easy thing to do, but are there yeah. examples you think now? Probably a lot. Mm -hmm. I know Lucy Bland, who uh, not Lucy Bland, sorry, um, Lucy Delap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lucy Bland's also a very good historian, but Lucy Delap was part of our project, and she's mm -hmm. uh, one of the people at History and Policy. Mm -hmm. And her work really, she actually writes about feminism, and her work does that really well. Mm -hmm. But outside of my field, um, I guess there's some like very famous historians like Timothy Snyder, um, and he's written this sort of handbook on. Um, on tyranny, so uh, connecting with your research. Well, he doesn't outright say it's about Trump, but anyway, it's about, uh, it was written in that era in terms of like looking at historical lessons um, from the area, area of the, like uh, mid 20th century and the, the Second World War and, uh, and afterwards and the rise of dictatorship. So it's sort of drawing lessons, wider lessons about democracy. Um, and I, I really like his his work in that he sort of steps back and talks again about um, the importance of history in terms of like helping people see facts and and the importance of facts and in terms of like ensuring that we don't have um, dictatorships <laughs> and that you need facts because you need facts to have the law and you need for law and law is necessary for democracy. So I think he's a, a really good example, uh, not in my field, but in who's um, stepped up and like put his neck on the line, I think, because it's uh, quite controversial, some of his, his um, well, it, some people find it anyway. Um, so I guess that's partly why some historians might not want to get involved in this political discussion for, f for concern about, about the, the repercussions of having such sort of um, public... Um, Notoriety, um, but do you have any examples of? I, th um, I, I, th I think that that's actually uh, a really, um, a, yeah, a, 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 well, a couple of really, really good, good examples. But you know, an interaction, you know, with as you say, the, the kind of conservatism that that I, I study, um, you know, I, I mean, Snyder is yeah, a, a, a great example, and I mean, yeah, the. the um, I mean, not only him, but you know, the examples that you offered. I mean, are not only you know engaging with these you know big big questions about the world, but they are doing it on the basis really of the kind of thorough research yeah. that yeah. Uh, that we. I guess it's important to all um, academics. You know, hi historians really value that kind of digging into the archives and yeah. getting a 
you know, um, yeah, do, do doing work which really takes you in the direction of having an authoritative view of, um, of uh, yeah, of a particular subject. So I would, I would, you know, I would echo you in, in thinking that those are some, um, yeah, uh, those are great examples. Yeah. And I was also wondering if you have any um, thoughts about the situation in different countries, mm -hmm. perhaps like mm -hmm. Finland, seeing as though yeah. we're here. Like yeah. I was, when you were talking, I yeah. was wondering if there's uh, do these uh, mm -hmm. gender gaps mm -hmm. occur in like Finland or the UK or like is it a international? Is it, does it matter yeah. about the national context? Um, yeah. It's, it's, so I, th I think I think all of those things are are, are right. That the national context. Uh, uh, matters and and doing these comparisons, um, you know, can be uh, well, not only can be, but it is something that's very difficult. But broadly speaking, um, you know, many countries over time, you know, show this evolution um, within a gender gap of moving from an older gender gap in which women overall seem to have been a bit more conservative than men, towards a modern gender gap in which in which women have been a bit more uh, liberally inclined than um, uh, uh, more, 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 in, more in alignment with liberalism than men have been. And, and, and the United States was maybe a little bit early um, in uh, moving in, in that uh, direction. I did have, uh, I guess, one or two um, examples. Um, and the, um, uh, if we look at... Um, I guess for one, ex what one example is in the uh, United uh, Kingdom, um, which in 2019, you see a, uh, something of a gender gap between uh, cons the Conservative uh, Party and um, the Labour Party, men more, um, uh, uh, men more supportive of conservatives than women were. And it's really, it's not shown in this chart, but the differences, in the case of the United States, the differences become more dramatic when we look at um, race as well. In the United Kingdom at the moment, the differences become more dramatic when you look at age as well. So younger women in the United Kingdom are overwhelmingly supportive of Labour, actually, even when Labour was doing quite badly, as was the case two years ago, whereas older people and older men, yet more than young than older women, very strongly on the side of the um, of the Conservatives. And then in in Finland, you you were talking about Finland, and I'm definitely in no way an expert on 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 Finland. There are some amazing experts here at the University of Helsinki, Anna Holly. Um, also, uh, Van Schultz um, and others who know about this, but just looking at looking at what happened a couple of years ago, I think Finland is a little bit different in the sense that for major parties, not so much of a gender gap, but for um, but for some parties, you can see there um, you do see differences between how how men and women are voting as well. So that's a little bit. Different, maybe, um, uh, maybe a reminder there that that adding comparison to historical perspective, um, you know, gives us lots to to think about. It also poses some challenges for us in in trying to understand, you know, uh, different places as well as different times. Thank you. That was re really interesting. Um, you have any more questions, or should we ask the audience? Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. So, so uh, there's. I guess. I guess the, 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 these are questions that, that that for us, you know, c can inspire. You know, really. I mean, it's it's to raising questions for further discussion rather than having a, a, a straightforward yeah. answer. And we're fortunate yeah. that at the Collegium to have time to yeah. uh, you know <laughs> to to uh, uh, to do that just as. You know, our, co our colleagues who have been part of this series as well have been able to pursue their own own questions. So, yeah. So, so we're grateful to the Kligian. We're, I guess, yeah. grateful too for our to our audience as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely.